Hello kind people of YouTube and welcome back to another video. As always, we're gonna take a quick look at the markets and then at some news coming out of the crypto world today. Now, the market today lost a bit of its gains from the last two days, but not all that much. Market cap now at 133.9 billion, just under 134 billion. That is about 4 billion down from the high we saw a day or two ago. You'll see here most major coins have lost below 7% with some even being able to gain some, notably Bitcoin Cash SV, which has been pretty much unlinked from the general market the last couple days, in part probably due to just being a newly established coin and being just around that $100 value where a lot of people are probably trying to um, take out their gains. So it keeps moving back and forth across 100. But there's nothing really interesting happening in the markets today. Um, except notably XRP still on number two. It is now officially the longest it has been on in the number two spot. To my knowledge ever, um, it has been in number two for over two weeks now and has almost three billion still between it and Ethereum. That's pretty significant. That is, um, I believe we can safely say the XRP Ethereum flippening has happened now. But let's look at some news. And as always, all these articles will be linked in the description if you want to read them yourself. First up, we have a German firm launching Bitcoin mining investment funds. Now that is of course not the same as a, as a Bitcoin ETF, but it is similar in that it's an investment product built on top of cryptocurrencies for institutional investors. And institutional investors are of course the ones that are putting millions and millions, possibly even billions into the markets. German investment firm Solaris has launched a European private equity fund focused on Bitcoin mining. They expect to raise 34 to 57 million dollars for the four year project, the company announced in a press release. Professional investors kept asking us to create a regulated product in the area of cryptocurrency, said Stefan Kleile, the CEO of Solaris. The fund has a minimum investment entry of 285,000 US dollars. And here you say what I just said, this is very much directed at institutional investors and at the 1% of the 1%. Not even directed at the 1% because the 1% doesn't have hundreds of thousands to just put into one individual investment product. This is directed at the 1% of the 1% and at institutions. He said the new fund is a joint venture with Mark Steer, the owner of an existing 2000 supercomputer mining farm in Sweden. Some of the fund's capital will be used to expand that data center. We decided on the joint product with Mark Steer because Mr. Steer already has an existing mining infrastructure in his project that has already proven to be producing Bitcoin successfully, Kleile said. That means several risks have already been eliminated. So Lawis said the location of the Bitcoin mining farm in Sweden is ideal because of the country's cooler climate and cheaper electricity costs. Sweden also has a political environment that could be more condu condu um, sorry, conducive not conductive, to cryptocurrencies because the country is rapidly becoming a cashless society. In fact, some Bitcoin miners in Norway are considering relocating to Sweden after the Norwegian government scrapped a tax subsidy on the electricity conferred to Bitcoin miners. And this is not the only fund they're launching, they're actually already planning a second one. The Xolaris Group is also planning to launch a separate $50 million Bitcoin mining fund in Hong Kong targeting Asian investors. Kleile said subscription for the Asian fund would start in December after it rolls out its flagship European fund. Kleile is unfazed by the current crypto bear market, saying it's actually an advantage for his firm because it will eliminate competition. We see the current price decline in Bitcoin rather positively, Kleile told the South China Morning Post. Bitcoin mining return is affected by a combination of drivers including Bitcoin price levels, hash rate, mining difficulty and the price of mining equipment such as servers. We see recent developments as giving our mining farm operator the opportunity to increase our market share. And that is all I'm going to read of this article, it does continue for a bit longer, but we have the core parts here. Two investment funds being launched, one in Europe, one in Asia. Now of course these are not for American investors. Those are, um, there are plenty of those upcoming, but we haven't seen a lot of funds on top of uh, mining before. We've seen, um, we've seen crypto funds, but not really crypto mining funds. So this is definitely something interesting. Now, this is obviously for long-term investment. This means there is a faith there that Bitcoin mining will be making good money at an exponential rate in the future. 
that is almost certain to be true. But you have to also keep in mind, this is um, this is also this company saying that they fully believe the Bitcoin price will, will gain significantly in value because that will be part of what offsets future increasing mining costs. So this is a very good hypothesis on where the market is going. And this is, of course, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of traditional finance, of institutional investor, of millionaire, of billionaire money flowing into products built on top of crypto. Very good for the crypto infrastructure to see all this money flowing in. And that's why I always talk about stuff like this whenever we see anything announced. But if you're just looking at November, it might look a bit bleak. And um, let's read this. Bitcoin price ends November with worst monthly decline in seven years. But I'll make the case for why this isn't necessarily as bad as it might seem. So don't, don't feel down over this. Just wait a moment. Bitcoin just ended its worst performing month in seven years in terms of month over month price declines. The world's largest cryptocurrency began November at an average price across exchanges of $6,341. But as of December, 1, uh, December 1st, it's trading at just $3,964. As it stands, the near $2,400 drop in price has created a 37.4% minus 37.4% monthly performance, which is its worst on record since August 2011, when it fell from roughly $8 to $4.80 to print a minus 40% monthly loss. And here you see the view from January 11 on. Since Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency in terms of market cap by a considerable margin, now comprising 53.5% of the total market cap, all other cryptocurrencies tend to follow its lead when it comes to price performance. As a result, the broader market suffered, a substantial, um, suffered substantial losses in November, which is one of the world's largest 25 cryptocurrencies able to post a monthly gain. The outlier was Bitcoin SV, a fork off of the original Bitcoin Cash blockchain, yet it has only existed long enough to accrue 22 days of pricing data on coin market cap. And here we see all the top coins and their monthly performance. Um, aside from Bitcoin Cash SV, which is of course newly created in a hard fork, we see Teva, of course, a stable coin. So there it's not too surprising that it only lost 0.3%. But aside from that, only two coins with losses under 20% and those are XRP and NEM. Everything else down over 20% with some coins even down over 50%. Bitcoin Cash almost 60% down. And Tezos is down 61.5%, VeChain 54%, and 0x 53%. So massive, massive amounts of um, market cap wiped out of the market this month. But here's why I don't think that is necessarily bad. Now, I've argued many times that um, that crashes are actually good for the long-term health of the markets on this channel. I've argued that crashes are necessary after bubbles because in those bubbles you have a lot of money FOMOing into the markets. You have a lot of people investing without properly doing their research and their due diligence. You have a lot of money just blindly flowing in with no rhyme or reason and that is not good for the health of the market. So when these bubbles crash, you have all these speculators are rushing out of the markets. They are scared. They are running away. That pushes the price down and down and down and down. But what happens is that that gives the that gives the crypto infrastructure time to be developed. That that influx of money is still in the market somewhere because a lot of it is also going to companies that are developing cryptocurrencies. There, um, a lot of that funding is going to companies that have um, upcoming blockchain projects. We of course saw the ICO boom. Um, in these bull ones that are um, that have to pop, they always they always have to pop because most of the ones that we have seen so far in the crypto markets were very much about hype and about FOMO. But they are still good for us even if they pop after because all that money flowing in that is mainstream exposure, that is billions flowing into companies that are working with crypto, that is major companies looking at crypto that previously did not, that is millions of people getting exposed to cryptocurrencies that previously did not. And then when they crash and when all these speculators flow out, the market itself is healthier than before because it now has still has more people in it, it had more time to develop, infrastructure can be built and we can do that silently and then the next bull run will be even bigger. And in the next bull run, we will see the same thing happening again. People will throw more in. Speculators will suddenly throw all their money at things that are unproven. They will, they will throw it without actually paying attention to what they're throwing their money at. Um, some of that money will go to legitimate projects, others will go to so-called shitcoins. That always happens. And then we will see a bubble that crashes again. But 
that is not necessarily bad. And um, after we see significant downturns is usually when we also see significant upturns. If you look at, um, at here, late 2011, you saw markets in a massive slump in one of the worst we have seen. And what do you see after? Shooting up, shooting up, shooting up, shooting up. Here is, well, instantly shooting up again, instantly shooting up again. Pretty much always what you see after significant market crashes. So much value is taken out of the market that we, that we at some point create a baseline, a baseline that we don't go below. And once that has happened, the only way is up and that tends to happen in a pretty explosive manner. Now, is anyone's guess where exactly the baseline for this, um, for this crash is? That is anyone's guess. But if you're looking at the long term, at the long term movements here, we are overdue for a massive bull run of the kind that we had in 2011, where we saw 350 percent growth, that we saw in 2014, where we saw 179 percent growth of the type we saw here late 2017, where we saw almost 500 percent growth. The bull run in late 2017, early 2018 was significant in sheer monetary value, but percentage wise, it wasn't nearly as huge as the ones we have seen before. And we are overdue for one of those again. And the more value gets taken out of the markets, the closer we are to that. But now let's look at some positive news for individual coins. Stellar registers 500% increase in active accounts during the last six months. That is quite a big number. That is, that is significant. The Stellar network continues to grow not only in terms of market cap, but also in the interest it generates in the public. XLM favorable, be, favorable behavior has led to, to increase its price to the point of surpassing Bitcoin Cash, displacing it from fourth place in the ranking of most important cryptocurrencies by capitalization. <coughs> According to data obtained from Stellar Expert, a block explorer and analytics platform for Stellar Network, its growth has been especially strong during the last half of the year. Stellar started the year 2018 with 162,000 active accounts. By mid-year, in the climax of a bearish streak, over 512,000 accounts had been registered. However, after that, and during the last semester of 2018, I think they mean quarter, not semester, Stellar's expansion was remarkable, exceeding 2 million active users. And you can see a graphic here. That is absolutely significant. They have gone from 100,000 to 2 million in a year here. And it's exponential. It is exponential growth. These figures represent more than 10 times the number of users the network had at the beginning of 2018 and five times the number of registered users registered at the start of the second half of the year. Stellar's official Reddit account shared the news with emotion, commenting that it took almost four years to get from zero to a million accounts and only two months to double that number. This prompted a series of responses in which users shared their impressions about what could be the causes of such extraordinary growth. And we don't really have to look into the rest of this. Um, some of it is almost certainly due to some large scale airdrops where a lot of people got, um, I believe it was $20, roughly $20 worth of XLM into their wallets, um, including the um, blockchain wallet where um, I've talked about it on this channel as well. But seeing the number of active accounts on the network increase so much, that is really impressive, really, really impressive. XLM, one of the most impressively performing cryptocurrencies this year in general. They have pretty good partnerships. They are working, of course, with IBM. There's a lot of good stuff happening in the Stellar camp. Um, but keep in mind here, um, just in case it's not completely clear, the cryptocurrency itself is called Lumens and Stellar is the network. There's a lot of um, confusion around that. They have also renamed their token a while ago. So that's, um, that's just added to it. But still looking very, very good lately. Um, a lot of good stuff happening around it and has now fully cemented itself as one of the major players in the crypto world with such exponential growth, quite significant, quite impressive. And last but not least, let's talk about Ripple for a moment because we have some statements from Dan Morgan. Ripple Inc. continues to focus on expanding its services and penetrating new markets, having conquered many customers throughout America and Europe, Asia seemed to have the company's last strategic point of interest. Asia is a complex market for many companies, even more so if they provide services such as Ripples that are still viewed with some skepticism by regulators. China, for example, has manifested an anti-crypto policy in spite of being one of the leading over-the-counter Bitcoin trading markets. Previously, Crypto Crimson reported that after a series of negotiations, Ripple achieved its milestone of establishing itself in China and did so in a big way. 
Thanks to a partnership with Lian Lian Group and American Express, this company will allow the processing of credit card payments in a proprietary network, contrary to the traditional system which used government-run networks. Um, what exactly is happening here is that American Express and Lian Lian Group are actually the partnership and um, Ripple's X current, I believe, is being used by Lian Lian Group to facilitate some of that. So Ripple is not in a direct partnership with American Express here, but Ripple is the technology being used by the partner of American Express in this um, joint venture. So that is still very, very big. On Friday at the Crypto Compare and MJAC London Blockchain Summit, Dan Moran, Ripple's head of regulatory regulations, uh, relations, not regulations, <laughs> for Europe, spoke not about Ripple's interest in Asia, he showed the other side of the coin. For Ripple, it is now increasingly evident that the Asian market is interested in technological solutions such as those provided by them. It's very early days, but we see the biggest appetite in Asian markets in terms of demand. So remittance demand, whether it is corridors that are underserved because corresponding banking is too costly. So we feel that there is demand. And for some context here, um, the Asian financial market is very complex. Asia is a very interesting continent as far as that is concerned, because you have a mix of um, you have a mix of very developed countries that are well established in international finance, such as Japan, and to a lesser degree, China, and Taiwan, and Singapore, and Hong Kong, and, um, well, not all of them countries, some are regions or, um, or independent, um, independent government regions. But um, you have those coexisting with countries where there isn't a well-established um, financial system with countries that are developing at a rapid pace, that, but that are very much still developing nations, such as India, such as the rural areas of China, such as Thailand, such as, um, such as Vietnam. There's, um, there's a massive, um, there's a, or, um, or the Philippines. There's just a massive range of different types of economies in Asia that you don't typically see on the same continent. So one important issue is the, um, is the correspondence between those different countries with the different systems, how to fit them all under the same umbrella. And traditional banking has not been very good at that. So it is, of course, very good for Ripple to scoop in here. Um, Asia and Africa are pretty much the two main markets where, where large populations are underserved by traditional banking and to a lesser degree South America as well. But those are really the two big markets where you can, where you can scoop in, where you can really gain market share, where you can make a difference with your product. And that is why, uh, why Ripple are aiming at that. For Mr. Morgan, Ripple can be instrumental in providing liquidity solutions that optimize the operation of markets. Until now, solutions such as XRapid and even transaction processing using XRP have been increasingly adopted by the Asian market. And another quote. Liquidity in terms of li digital assets, most liquidity we have is in Asian markets by some distance. He also commented that Asian markets need to have greater clarity regarding the legislation that regulates not only the markets, but also blockchain technology. He also mentioned that Thailand is one of the key countries for the expansion of Ripple in the Asian continent. And one last quote. Again, we see a number of pockets around Asia where they are further ahead that we are here. Thailand, I talked about, obviously Japan is another place. So you are absolutely right, it is Asia. I wouldn't want to pin down exact markets in Thailand, for instance, with that regulation. I think Siam Commercial Bank is really active now in terms of settlement digital assets activity. So we see here Ripple talk about, or rather a representative for Ripple talk about the increasing interest in Asia. Now, not all of these are necessarily using XRapid or the XRP token, but it is important to remember here that any progress for Ripple ultimately has Ripple effects. That was half intentional. <laughs> has Ripple effects on Ripple's other technologies and they are trying to further increase connectivity between them. So any bank that is currently or any financial institution that is currently not using XWAP and not using the XRP token could very well be onboarded to that and thus be very, very positive for the XRP ecosystem in the future. And with this, I'm going to end today's video. Um, as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I will be back either later with another video if I find the time or tomorrow. Um, if you like this video and you're not subscribed yet, you should probably change that. <laughs> if you are subscribed and you really like my videos, there are some ways to support me in the description. Um, donation addresses for crypto donations, a PayPal donation link through um, coffee, 
and a Patreon where you can give a small monthly amount and you get some perks for that, so do check that out. In the description you'll also find the links to all these articles as well as my social media pages. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys soon.